Hey, it's Jaime with Echo Real Estate Advisors. Today, Echo interviews Leo Pareja, CEO and founder of Remind, the property intelligence platform that is taking over. If you haven't heard about it by now, it's because you're behind, so you need to get on it. Go to Remind.com and thank me later. Leo was named one of the most powerful people in residential real estate today. By age 28, he was the number one Keller Williams agent in the world. He founded Washington Capital Partners, one of the largest private lending companies in the mid-Atlantic region. In 2017, Leo served as the president of NAREP and has a board seat at NAR, the National Association of Realtors. In today's interview, we cover what the industry is doing, where it's going, and how you thrive in it. And of course, he'll share what he would do if he were to start all over again today. Thank you so much for joining us in this very special interview. And let me know what your takeaway was in the comments section below. Enjoy. All right, welcome to Echo Interviews. So glad to have you again. Today, you're in for a very special treat. He is the boss of Mega Bosses, Leo Pareja, founder and CEO of Remind. Leo, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Jamie. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Hey, so right off the bat, congratulations on being named one of, me, one of the most powerful people in real estate today. That is amazing. Congrats. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, hey, let's just jump right into it. People aren't here for me. People are here to listen to what you have to say. So, right off the bat, what industry are you in right now and how did you get started? So I'm, uh, I'm in the industry I've been in my entire life. So I just, I'm in a different part of it now, but um, I'm in the residential real estate space. I got into real estate at 19 years old, sold real estate for about 15 years. Along those 15 years, I pretty much touched everything you can touch with inside of residential real estate from selling it, buying it, flipping it, fixing it, holding it, developing it from the ground up. I did some commercial as well. And Along the way, I started a private debt fund, and most recently, I started a software company that services that industry. That is, so yeah, you've done everything. You've done everything. Is there a particular part of real, real estate that you really enjoy? Uh, I've enjoyed all of it. I, I think I, I truly enjoy uh, the, the process. I, I would say as an entrepreneur, I love the process of zero to one, you know, from nothing to creation. And I would say I'm, I'm probably not the best at operating it once I get it started. I, I, I go find people who are smarter and better at me at that. Uh, but I, I, liked, um, I like seizing on opportunities, whether it's market or timing. I, I uh, tell people all the time, I'm, I'm not good at predicting the future. I'm just really good at being aware of my surroundings. And typically, if you can stop and take a really good inventory of your surroundings, you can see that stuff's coming around the corner and most people are just too busy in the day-to-day -to, -day to kind of take that in. And I've been fortunate enough to, to pay attention for the last 10 years and make some pretty well-timed pivots uh, and take advantage of uh, a next wave, if you will. Okay, okay. So again, you're the founder and CEO of Remind. So a lot of our audience, a good amount of our audience, they're actually power users. Um, and I'm gonna guarantee that everyone watching has heard of Remind at this point. So it was a big, it's actually a big part of this channel to be completely honest with you. I think you've seen that from, from your end as well. But um, so talk, talk to us a little bit about how the idea of Remind came about and what, what did you do to you know, kick that forward? Yeah, so uh, my background is not software. I'm not a technologist, which is actually how I start almost every meeting at the MLS level when I get Remind into a market, which, uh, you know, I, I am a product of this industry. I have a deep amount of love and respect for our profession, and I consider it a craft and a profession. And you know, sometimes when I, I get on, on, a, on a stage, I, I get controversial because I, I am a uh, fervent defendant of the profession, and that's against in people who want to disrupt it and get us out of it, but also as much from the wannabes who don't take it seriously and, you know, are in it for a quick buck. And, and hurt customers because in the long run, that's what gives customers a bad uh, experience and gives our entire profession a bad name. Um, but the reason Re Remind was born is because I was frustrated. You know, to do one thing, and again, you and I have 
uh, had conversations and that's how we met is because you commented how easy it was to do stuff and I actually reached out to you, which we can talk about because I don't care how big your business gets. It's belly to belly relationships that build every business. Um, even if you're building a software company, it's still people to people. Yeah. But truly, you know, it was the fact that in order to do my daily workflow, I would have to go into not only MLS, I'd have to go to county websites. I would then have to go to a different system for consumer lookup information. And I found myself going to six to 12 places on a sequential basis. So it wasn't like, an, you know, an oddball workflow. It was a daily workflow. And hell, there was no mobile version of any of it, right? It was like, I'd have to sit in front of my, you know, air, tra air traffic control station with three monitors with three or four different websites open with an Excel spreadsheet open to do one task. And, yeah. And, you know, again, I grew up in a said market where we didn't have public record user interface. It was just MLS. So I think my frustration was more exacerbated. Um, but, you know, a lot of frustrating moments in history have created pretty cool products and services. So we built it for our internal consumption. I never intended to commercialize it. And I've sold it to a couple of friends and they're like, I'd pay you for that. And then I decided if I were to commercialize it, you know, go to market strategy and distribution and total virtual market are very important decisions I make as an entrepreneur, depending on the vertical, you know, we're looking at. And I knew I didn't want to be one more expensive product that sells directly to agents. Yeah. Which would have been my go to market strategy because the data is expensive and it's very difficult right. to put together. And so the only way to make it financially and logical was to have mass distribution. And that's, that was to me, the MLS, the MLS, or I was not interested. I could have gone to brands, uh, but I still didn't think it was wide enough. Uh, you and I would have never met. You're, you're not, you're not affiliated with a large brand either. So you would have never heard from me. Right. Unless I did a Facebook ad or a email campaign and that's expensive. You literally, correct me if I'm wrong, you were, on your MLS dashboard on Netris and found it, right? Yeah. And that is the most powerful form of distribution and I was delivering a lot of value, so that's, that's, that's how I designed the entire business model. Um, but for me, it was, it was that way or bust. And I truly think that it's technology like ours, not just ours, it keeps the agents of the next decade super relevant by empowering them to give them more data than the consumers have available to them on their own. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when, as you're identifying, so you're clearly a leader in not only in this space, but in several spaces as people that viewed the intro are well aware, what kind of feedback were you getting from other brokers, from other people in the industry as you know, they clearly have the same pain point. You weren't necessarily the first one to have that pain point, but you went beyond and Yes, that you identified it. You, yeah, you identified it, and but then you actually did something about it. What kind of feedback were you getting from other agents, from other brokers, from other people in the industry yeah, it, it as you were going? Buckets. One is, I, I thought of this, I should have done it. That's, that's one portion of the population. And then uh, the vast majority, when there's the humbling and most rewarding part is, I'm so grateful that you did it. You know, I, I was just in Cali this week and I did a presentation and one agent just stood up and smiled and he goes, I knew somebody was going to do it. I was just waiting for that day. Here's my credit card. Sign me up. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> user. You know, like that, I knew somebody was going to fix this. We should have had this a long time ago. Yeah. Great. Good up. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's get a little bit macro because I love how you were able to identify trends and you have the self-awareness and there's so many more of the gifts. So real estate, there is a lot of money pouring into real estate from every avenue, whether that's private, public, whatever happy, and everyone's flooding in, raising capital, and they're trying to reinvent real estate in some capacity. Now, the difference with Remind is that you're actually looking to keep the agent in business versus it appears that some other companies, whether they're telling you not, whether they're telling you to your face, like, yeah, we're your friend, but we're really not, um, they're not. So can you give us kind of like the, yeah. Yeah. Opinion on, on so, the, hey, the, the first thing I'll tell you is I've been in the industry for 20 years. I've seen more change in the last 18 months that I've seen in the first 20 years. So 
I'm, I, I, my prediction is in 36 months from now, stuff's going to look substantially different than it looks today. But I don't even know who the clear winner is. And this, this just for context, because I think data gives you context. Yeah. In 2010, the total capital investment that, would it, would, that went into the category that's considered prop tech was 10, or $30 million total. 2010, $30 million total. Okay. As an as a, as a industry vertical. Okay. 2017, it was $5.4 billion in the U.S. Globally, it was $12 billion. The 2018 numbers aren't out, but I think it's higher than that. Oh, man. So, so what, what is without a shadow of a doubt now, in my humble opinion, is that it's like, you know, everyone woke up and is making a bet that it's inefficient and it needs improvement. And who's going to win is up for grabs. I truly don't see a clear winner yet. Uh, but what is abundantly clear is the smartest money in the world said, there's a better way to do this. And I mean, when I say the smartest money in the world, it's just see the names of the funds who've written checks into this. It's Founders Fund, it's Adreesan Hurwitz, it's, it's Sequoia, it's Excel, it's Insight, it's Bessemer, it's, you know, the who's who of smart money in this country and globally, because we have companies like Purple Bricks and other uh, disruptors, not even from our con continent coming into our country now. Hmm. And so what I do know is that money doesn't, you know, make bets and say, oh, well, that was a bad hand. I'm going to go home. <laughs> Someone is going to win. Yeah. And some are going to get a tremendous return on their investment. And, you know, the, the mainstream of iBuyers is a super interesting one, you know, because what I'm obsessed with is behavior. And so what portals did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is it changed consumer behavior. Yeah. And so agents, consumers now start on the internet, right? There's a stat in the uh, NAR report that said 74% of all buyers who purchased a home found that one particular property on the internet prior to selecting the buyer's agent in like 2017, like really recent report, mm -hmm. right? 70, I think 75% of those still used a realtor, but they found the house on themselves, a, right? Yeah. So even from a scripts and dialogue standpoint, I said to agents, you got to understand that. So when you were having that initial buyer consultation, you're actually setting the expectation with the consumer. It's like, Hey, congratulations. I'm really excited. You're, you're qualified to 300,000 and we're going to go look at homes in Dallas. Just as an FYI, this search process is a collaboration between you and I, and don't be surprised. And most likely you're going to find the home. We ultimately write a contract on your own. And it's your job to call me to then get you into the house. And really my job starts at ratification. And my job is to guide you as the expert of all the legal pitfalls, get you through the home inspection process, get you through the lending process, make sure no one takes advantage of you. And that's 80% of the value I bring to you starts at the time of ratification because it's really negotiating that contract, getting your concessions, protecting you legally. Does that make sense? Right? That's by saying that, yeah, you remove the hey, what, what actually do you do for that money? Right? I'd found the house, what are you doing for me? Right? Yeah, because the reality is the, the heavy lifting is post finding the house. And if you don't communicate that to your customer, then they're going to be by themselves as a first time home buyer, never going through this process, making assumptions as to the value you bring to the table. And I would say that, and I would say that most realtors don't actually do a good job of articulating the 80 tasks we complete during a transaction. Cause it's kind of weird to be like, Hey, by the way, I submitted this form, by the way, I did this awesome research for you and I protected you. Right. We don't do that as a process. Right. So by being able to articulate that, but, but the behavior from the buy side has shifted in the sense where a lot of consumers do a lot of self-selection ahead of time. And we really haven't had that behavior change on the seller side of the transaction. And I truly think that iBuyers could change that relationship where you go to a website first and, and, and maybe get an offer first mm -hmm. before you decide to take it to market. And so that, that is something I'm watching carefully over the next three to five years. Um, you know, I think the more data that's available, you, it, it's going to exacerbate the haves and the have nots from the practitioner standpoint, meaning the, the super agent, the mega agent is going to continue getting bigger and more efficient. 
right? Because there's just that much more leverage. Yeah. And the the new it's going to be that much harder to break into the space. Really, so, it's going to be harder. I, I believe that because of the digital footprint that is now the barrier of entry. So our industry, whether by design or by accident, is has a very low barrier of entry, which has been a phenomenal uh, wealth creation tool for all kinds of folks. You know, yeah. a lot of people in real estate, first generation immigrants, came from another career. You know, the the wealth that can be created in real estate as an industry is phenomenal and beautiful and kind of unparalleled in this country. For really like four to six hundred bucks, you can get into our space and you can make as much money as you want. There's really Unlimited. no Unlimited. Um, but the downside of that is you can also make zero. No one cares, right? And that's why we have half of the licensed population in this country that sold zero homes last year. And what they have, I like to refer to as a hope certificate, not a real estate license. They hope somebody is going to trust them with a very expensive transaction, which is not a good consumer experience. But the more data has become available, not just like the kind of data I show you, but how consumers make business decisions. So I love it when I'm on a panel and someone's like, well, millennial behavior is this and boomers is that. I said, it's bullshit. It's human behavior. Yeah. I don't care if you're a boomer, a millennial, or like the Snapchat generation. The reality is if somebody says, you should go watch a movie, Jamie, you and I have pretty good rapport, um, but you may just jump on Rotten Tomatoes just to verify I have a good taste in movies. <laughs> true? That's true. Even though I gave you a referral, you, 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 you trust me, but you're gonna verify my opinion. Right. And that's how we make decisions. So I was in LA all week on Monday through Wednesday when you followed me on social and you, you saw my, how quickly I moved through a city. The reality is I find myself in Chino Hills or Bria or Irvine. There's so many different neighborhoods in, 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 in uh, California that I actually didn't even book my hotel because I didn't know where traffic was going to leave me by the end of the day. <laughs> and it was literally, I was finished at my last appointment. I said, at six, I'm hungry. You know, open table, what's the closest restaurant to where I'm standing? And I literally went, who's got the highest stars that has seafood? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And while I was eating, I was on the phone with my buddy who I was going to see in the morning. I was like, hey, I have, to, I have to be at your office, but then I have to be down in Beverly Hills by noon. He goes, dude, stay where you are. Because I was literally going to drive down to Beverly Hills. It's like, two, right now it's two hours. Eat dinner where you are. Stay in one of these couple hotels. He gave me two names. Yeah. One was $200 more and they were rated the same. So I stayed at the other one. Makes right? sense. But I made these decisions, even though with referrals, with still some verification of data at my fingertips right? as it belong, pertains to being a realtor and forget what we do at Remind, which, you know, could be argued as for very sophisticated agents who are taking their business to the next level. I'm talking about if you will never use predictive analytics and, and, and target market based on criteria, but if you want to be a realtor in this country right now, do you have Google reviews or Zillow reviews, right? Do you have a lot of them? Yeah. Do you, are you, are you authoring that voice? Right? Because if you're not on purposely asking for happy customers to give you your reviews, unfortunately, the only reviews you're probably going to have is someone who's pissed off. Because it's human nature. People yeah. don't, don't stop and say, Hey, by the way, you're killing it right now for me. It's more, they normally only stop when they're pissed. Yeah. And if you don't have a system and a process to create screaming, raving fans that document it, and create that digital footprint for you. Because really an interview now starts on Google. I don't care if it's a job interview, a romantic date. I mean, it's not uncommon for us to jump on LinkedIn or social before you meet somebody. I do when I'm meeting a customer, a potential customer, I go on their LinkedIn profile, see where they previously worked because as a salesperson, which I still am, even though I'm the CEO of a software company because I'm, I'm evangelizing whether it's to an MLS or agent myself, it allows you to build rapport fast. If it's like, hey, I see you went to Georgetown University. I grew up in DC. What years were you there? What, what was your favorite restaurant? Did you, do you remember that, you know, the brass monkey down and I used to go there when I was 21. I met my wife there, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Or it's like, I see you went to Michigan State. I heard that Detroit's had a huge turnaround in the last 10 years before. It allows you to build rapport and people at the end of the day do business with people they like. And so- 100%. So when it comes to the future of our industry and the, I'm not, I, I didn't go on a tangent and forget what I was talking about. It's the fact that I think it's going to be harder and harder for you to break in 
-hmm. because of the digital moat that's being created by the haves and the have nots. So I'll give you a perfect example. When I was 23 years old, I was the number one agent in my office. I was doing about $20 million a year. Back then, people weren't doing the units we see now. I could walk into an appointment 10 out of 10 times and lose to the 56-year-old who just got into the business but wore a suit and drove a nice car because they looked the part. She or he would beat me every time because I was 23. I could barely grow facial hair and I just looked like a kid even though I was more experienced and talented than them in my industry because there was no way for them to verify. Right. To Right? It was like, I'm the number one agent in my office. And the other guy's like, I'm the number one agent in my office. And agent <laughs> something, right? Every single agent in the country is. You know, my mom thinks I'm number one. But now, that same consumer can go onto Zillow and look up your Zillow profile and 100%. see 68 closed transactions. And then they can see the other agent's seven closed transactions, right? Towards the latter part of my career, someone could go on Zillow. And, you know, it only conflated one MLS feed, even though I participated in four, but on one of them, it showed 1,800 close transactions. I could theoretically walk into that listing appointment in jeans and a t-shirt and flip-flops. And my presentation be, Google me, I'll wait, here, sign the paperwork, I'm leaving. Because my reputation was verifiable by a third party. Right. And that was, that is more important to consumers right now than anything else. So on that there's a lot of agents you i mean you just gave the statistic there's a lot of agents that are struggling so what's the biggest thing that you're seeing that they're doing wrong right now so i mean I, this is independent of you know we were kind of talking about what we see happening right now with technology and the capital being infused but right the question you're asking to me it's i've, I've seen my entire career and part of it is the industry's fault because we've always described real estate as this like super flexible, easy way to make money, work on your own terms. That's all BS. Cause I am friends with all the top agents in the country and they're the most inflexible schedule ridden, <laughs> you know, pragmatic systems oriented, cold calling prospecting machines I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Right. So the people who succeed in this industry treat it like a business. Right. Right. It's, it's either your practice, which means you are a solo agent with a couple people, or you build a big team and both are cool. Both are cool and good if you're happy with it and you're servicing your customers, right? I don't, I think a solo agent with maybe an assistant or one buyer's agent, it could be even better experience than a large team. I, I actually wholeheartedly believe that, but you got to take it seriously. You got to treat it like a business. Like, do you prospect every single day? And if you don't practice prospect, do you have a system, whether it's Facebook ads, direct mail, whatever it is that generates systematic levels of leads and conversion for you to have a sustainable way of earning a living. And yeah. so I don't know the statistics to verify off the top of my head, but the percentage of agents that are struggling today is no different than five years ago. It's no different than 10 years ago. It's, it's, we are in an aspirational business, right? HGTV has probably exacerbated the problem over the last 10 years. Cause it's like, Oh, what pisses me off more than, anything is the flip your house shows because I've <laughs> more homes than most people who are on TV and I own one of the largest private debt funds on the East coast. But it's like, even the numbers they put on the screens, like, Hey, bought it for a hundred, put 40 in it, selling it for 160 potential profit of 20. I'm like, that is a, that is a lie. Right. So the you're telling me they're not making those margins. <laughs> and no, it's, it's and you know, if you bought it for a hundred, you know, it's 104 with closing costs. Yeah. It took yeah. six months to sell. So there's at least eight grand in holding costs. So we're at 112. And then at 160, you're telling me you don't have any costs of goods sold between buyer comp. Even if, even if the owner is an agent, they're mm -hmm. still paying buyer con co commissions. They're paying concessions and transfer recordation. So on that one plus 40 is 160 is 20,000 in potential profit. They're really upside down $20,000. They've, they've, they've written a, uh, a $20,000 check to get out of that deal. Yeah. And so that only makes it worse that more people want to come into this industry and are ill-prepared or not, you know, it could be ill-prepared because they didn't financially prepare to come into this industry. Meaning no one told them the truth that you need to have 12 months reserve in the bank. Yeah. Literally your first six months, I don't know anyone who made money before the first six months. And so a lot of people that are younger want to get into the industry. They're like, Hey, I want to get into real estate. I said, great, go find who do you want to become? Like go find 
the icon or agent that you want to be most like in your in, in your local town and offer them offer him or her to work for free go work for free for them for six months and what most solid business people will do is like no need to work for free i have a position open for talented people and join their team either as an employee on a salary or as a as an agent and they shorten the learning curve dramatically yes you get a much lower split but you get leads off the bat and you get technology and training and you know all the the things that proper team should offer. Right. Um, and so I think too many people aren't willing to kind of eat a little crow for a, a couple of years, but I would encourage everybody, especially starting out to join a team, um, especially like a legit team. Cause then that's a whole nother subject we can go into. I, I think there's a whole category of teams that I refer to as gangs. Cause it's just a bunch of agents that kind of work together loosely to maybe get lower splits and, but they're not a team. Like, Right. A team who have a, a central place that is spending real money to generate leads in a systematic form and offer it with technology systems and processes and support, right? So it's not just a lead, it's, it's CRM, it's IDX website, it's transaction management. And yes, you should get a substantially lower split than if you were the team lead, but you should be able to do 5, 10x the volume. Um, and at the end of the day, it's when I used to run a team, we split, but what do you want to make this year? If I hit X, are you happy? Right. I had buyer's agents on my team that made $150,000 a year. You know, my primary listing agent when the last year we were in business made like $250,000 with no overhead and no risk. Right. That's wow. a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what, 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 what would keep those after seven years, but, um, <laughs> You know, I, I, we, we are living through an interesting time and everything in, in, in life is a cycle and a phase. Right now, post financial crisis, I would say from 2012 and on, we've been living in this age that glorifies entrepreneurship. And um, I, get, I get pretty pissed off about it sometimes um, because I see a 23 year old have an Instagram profile that says they're a business coach. Mm hmm. You're not, you're not qualified to be a business coach or an expert. You haven't lived long enough. You haven't accomplished, like, I think the only way you deserve that title is because you did something of meaning, not just took a boot camp, right? And so. Yeah, not just purchased a course, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I see it with the realtors. I, I see realtors who've been at it for five or six years who, you know, are keynote speakers and coaches and all this stuff. It's like, you have not lived through a financial crisis. You do not know a single price reduction script. You have not actually lived through some shit, right? And so the, 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 the legit rite of passage of entrepreneurship is getting beat down a couple of times. You know, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't know who to give attribution to a favorite quote of mine I've had. You cannot make a large fortune until you first lost a small one, right? It's, wow. it kind of teaches you respect uh, because there's, there's, you know, there's so much you can, YouTube you can watch and books you can read, but you haven't really lived through the experience yet. I remember when I was building my first couple of businesses, someone asked me if I'd ever been sued. And I was like, no, I do everything right. It's like, well, if you haven't been sued, you have not done enough business yet. Like you haven't had enough at bats. Yeah. And it was one of those like, oh shit moments in life where I haven't lived enough. <laughs> and so it's like, well, you, you haven't had enough at bats, right? I remember being on a panel of investors once and this guy next to me said he's never lost money on a flip. And I was like, I literally stopped him. I was like, you haven't done enough deals because in life you can't underwrite everything. You can't know that there's a crack in the foundation until you open up the walls and you're like, there's a crack in the foundation. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm on a rant. I'm sorry there. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's good. I can safely say that I have been sued multiple times. So, um, <laughs> But I don't think that's because of my amount of deals. I think that's because I was just careless. But no, I... I but be either way, you learn. Exactly. Exactly. You're, um, you have to cut that check. That, that, that's, and that check... That's your tuition. That's your tuition. That, that check is more valuable than anything else, right? For sure. I used to do some seminars. It's like, oh yeah, I got the seminar on not doing X and it was $32,000. And I got the other seminar that cost me $127,000. Because... <laughs> You know, you can, you can read it and some, and there was those times where I lost large sums of money and I had read yeah. the, the book. I had read that do not do this, but you're still <laughs> kind of like that lack of experience makes you overconfident. That's true. That's true. So switching gears over to, 
to remind. Um, so those people, real estate agents, that what type of feedback are you getting from those real estate agents as soon as they touch remind? I, I want to hear more about that because I'm sure you get your inbox must be full with success stories with like, hey, this is the greatest thing ever. And that's not just from me, but what type of feedback are you getting from Remind? Um, what do you see the future? What do you see Remind in three to five years? Yeah, so I appreciate that. No, so, you know, and, and just as transparently, we actually, we almost hear more from the agents that are not happy about something because again, it's human nature. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but that, I, I love that because, you know, if I get eight realtors to tell me the same thing out of 10 people who reach out, I obviously have an issue I need to correct, mm -hmm. right? And so that negative feedback loop is almost as important as the positive one. And that's what I love about having like a Facebook user community. And like uh, Tom Ferry emailed me earlier today saying that at his next event, by demand of his customers, there was going to be a Remind breakout session. Like wow. he was hosting a, a poll inside of their user community. They said, what subjects? And literally there's enough agents who like, hey, said, we want to have our own breakout session just about Remind. So I might fly in and surprise them all. Um, and so... I think for the folks that get it and are willing to put in the work, it's a no brainer, right? It becomes daily active workflow. And one of the things I talk about when I talk is that it's a platform, not a product. And that's a really big distinction. So like a smart zip is a product. It is designed for geographic farming and I have no beef with them, love it or hate it. It, 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 it works. But if you have a customer and let's say you bought a geographic zip code or census track or neighborhood, in any product, because that's how all products are sold. You know, if you get a referral and you do a great job for that family, what happens is they may refer you their child who can't afford to be, but three counties away because they need a starter home. Well, if you don't have a platform that says, here's the mouse, go nuts, do whatever you want, it actually becomes really hard to add value through products because products are typically very sideload into like, hey, I need this for X. Right. And the fun part to get to your question is I hear just as many different ways people use the product. And that's the fun part for me. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the, the obvious one, it's like, Hey, I used to send out 3,500 pieces of mail per month and I got half a percent return and it was good money. Right. But now I'm saying, I'm now I'm hearing people tell me that, that, that knew their numbers and that's where it's more interesting to me where now they're getting 3% return. They're maybe spending the same nominal dollars, but they were able to, instead of sending out 3,500 pieces, they reduced it down to 600, right? Yeah. And instead of sending a three and a half by, or a three, six and a half by five card, now they're sending a color letter, right? Because it's way more targeted. I had an agent in Southern California call me, who's a good friend of mine. Um, and he just said, he's like, I now got it down to for every 168 letters I send, I get a listing. I was like, wow, <laughs> right? And he said, and, and I was like, well, what do you send them? Because I love to know that stuff. He's like, you're going to be embarrassed when I tell you what I send them. I was like, just tell me. He's like, literally it says, handwritten, have you considered selling your home in the next 30 days? I have some interested folks. And he sticks in two business cards and he sends it. He's like, that's it. That's all I send. And the phone rings. <laughs> right? Because it's hyper-targeted. Like right. he specifically uh, works with investors a lot in Southern California. And he said, I will search for multifamily, which is a filter, 20 years on title, which is a filter mm -hmm. and no mortgage. And by the way, all three of those filters are in my included version. It's not even in the pro, right? Right. And he's specifically looking for multifamily investors at the tail end of their investment cycle, right? Because like I told you, everything's a cycle, right? Your yeah. life is a cycle. So these ladies or gentlemen have had an asset for 20 years and specifically looks for no mortgage and on title for 20 years because that asset from an IRS standpoint is fully depreciated. Meaning when that, that seller sells that property, they're actually going to get a big old tax bill, right? Because they took the depreciation on the property as well. So in their pitch, they've actually said, can we seller finance the building? which reduces the upfront tax bill for the seller, creates cash flow for the seller, which they literally trade tenants and toilets for a first deed of trust position on a property they know. That is a deal most investors will do, right? All day long. Well, I, I'd much rather finance a building I know inside and out and make you put 20% down. And if you don't pay me, I take it back. Good deal, right? Yeah. 
but uh, interest payment is way better than collecting rent, especially in Southern California, right? <laughs> yeah. So he knows exactly what he's looking for. And where I get the, the best, the best uh, success stories is the agents that actually have become experts at a niche. And I think that's how you get the most value. You work the best, you deliver the most value, right? And again, just as, just as I have those conversations, I have an agent who says, I've been in the business. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gal in Southern California that uh, I've gotten to know pretty well because she was commenting on the Facebook page. And she literally said, this is my year one. I was struggling at it. I came from a corporate background where there was a lot more structure to my world. And I felt that I was floundering. And then I found your product. She's like, I'm now hired my first assistant. I have two buyer's agents because I can actually sit down and have a workflow of like, I don't have a network. I, th I think the agents that are the slowest to adopt us are the ones who are killing it and are too busy. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the ones that like, especially because compared to the other systems, right. Whether it's matrix, Paragon, flex, rapid Tony, all of them, they're an older system that we take for granted how complicated it is to look stuff up in there. Right. You yeah. almost need a computer science degree in order to do advanced searches that like you and I were talking about before we started recording. And so if you have no context to the current systems, and fortunately for us, we're part of onboarding education at all the associations and MLSs, right? If you've never entered the other platforms and then you get us the same day, you're like, there's a choice here? Like, <laughs> it feels like Google Maps or feels like Zillow or feels it's like it's a smart search bar. If I, if I need to look up Jamie, I just type your name into the bar and I'm sure you've done it in your market and you come right up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Versus it's like, wait, I go to have to go to tax and then I add a field and first lane, last name. And then like, what? That doesn't make any sense to me. The only reason I can operate through an MLS is because I sold real estate for 15 years and I got really efficient at it, but it's not intuitive. And not so, so when you were telling you again, tying it back to the early question is the customer will always win. So if we as an industry don't get our stuff together and deliver experiences for consumers that are seamless and painless, whoever does wins. And so like, I think a lot of the innovation that is coming and needs to come is in the mortgage side, right? Something you and I can't control as realtors, but compare the mortgage experience in this country to any other transaction we do. It is literally asinine. Yeah. So I, I, I refinanced our house recently. Uh, a year ago, we got a 30 year fixed mortgage and I had not done a mortgage since pre crisis. Right. Yeah. I mean, I recently had a vasectomy and I was awake and that was less painful than getting more. <laughs> Cause it is, it is embarrassing. It, it like you, you bear your soul, right. Then yeah. you just tell you that you're not good enough because some stuff that happened seven years ago. It's like, well, why did you do that? It's like, well, obviously I did it because I was in a situation where it's <laughs> health, financial crisis. Like you obviously don't purposely miss payments or rack up debt <laughs> because you wanted to. And, and if you look at the data, like Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, when it launched in 2016, I think it was after the Super Bowl, within their first 11 months, they did like $7 billion in business. Yeah. And that app was launched as a retention tool to defend their portfolio. It was actually not launched as a, as a purchase tool. It was like 60% of the transactions ended up being purchased. Really? And more millennials. And when JD Power and Associates did a survey of it, they said, why? And they said, because it was anonymous and painless. Like the process of applying for a mortgage as a first time home buyer. A, again, I'm all over the place because that's kind of how I am when I'm talking. But like, we're not educated on credit in this country. We're just not. Yeah. We're not educated on taxes and tax efficient vehicles and whether you want to be W2 or 1099 or is an investment long-term capital gains versus short-term capital gains and what's deductible and swap. That is not taught anywhere, right? And so as a 26 year old, a 38 year, 20, 32 year old, you know, newly married or you have a life partner, it's can we buy? How do we buy? And what consumers said on playing with Rocket Mortgage, it was anonymous in the sense I downloaded the app, I authenticated a couple things, and it was like, congratulations, you can buy. Or, so close, please 
do these couple of things, right? Let's get your credit score yeah. up points and yeah. gamify it, right? Yeah, you remove all that friction. And, and you remove the friction by like, hey, you already have three trade lines. And again, I'm not telling you Rocket Mortgage does this, but this is the type of stuff that's coming because if I'm thinking about somebody else is doing it, right? It, you know, so I taught a credit class recently to my employees, which the average age is like 26. And literally all of them were blown away. They said it was like a fascinating class in adulting. <laughs> and, and, and I employ some super smart, talented kids who come from great backgrounds. Right. But nobody sits down with them and say, hey, do you know what the ideal amount of trade lines is? Crickets. It's like we need a minimum of three, right? And a lot of them said, hey, I didn't want a credit card because I saw what happened in the financial crisis and I don't, I don't want the liability. But nobody says, no, you need at least two. And by the way, you need to use it every month for it to give you credit. Because a lot of them said, hey, I opened one up and then I didn't use it. And by the way, the usage, don't exceed a 30% spend on your limit. Exactly. Doesn't mean right. go max it out. <laughs> but, but this is the, I, I actually had a one-on-one -on -one session with one of my younger salespeople who asked to be on my calendar because he wanted it further one-on-one -on -one coaching on it. And he said, I did exactly what you said. And they gave me a credit limit of 300, right? Well, hundred bucks for, you know, date night, you're already over what you should be maximizing on your limit. So he put his Netflix on it and it's on auto pay. And I said, little, put, mark your calendar for six months from now and then call them and increase it. And they'll probably jump you to 5K. It'll surprise you how fast they go up once you start having credit Absolutely. history. But that is friction, right? So the bottom line with consumer behavior is we all want a frictionless experience. And, you know, everyone talks about Uber. Uber was not the first. Sidecar was. Yeah, that's true. That's Most people true. have never heard of Sidecar. It was their idea, right? Because I can't tell you how many times I've had an Uber conversation about something with somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, Sidecar did too. And that's <laughs> Every, everybody wants to be the Uber of something, right? Right, but, but, but there was someone before Uber who had the idea and just didn't execute correctly, right? Travis, Travis knew how to execute. It, boy, it, it's all about removing the friction. So I, I think, bringing it back to our industry, I think in the next, and that's what I'm saying, in 24 or 36 months, we're going to see some stuff change. So like you've read that mortgage lenders are in trouble because the yield premium spreads are compressing and, you know, with the rates going up, refis dried down. What is happening as a byproduct is people are trying to squeeze out efficiency and they're doing it through technology. So most people don't know that there's a program at Fannie called Day One Certainty that lenders can work with. And that's what... Um, Rocket Mortgage is built on, that is a seamless mortgage process where you're literally going through DU and getting a legit approval within seven seconds. And the way they're doing that is, you know, for asset verification, you're actually authenticating your Bank of America login and the computer is verifying, yep, they, they have the assets, right? Yeah. And then you authenticate paychecks. Yep, they have the income. And you know, you authenticate the income and, the, you know, your 401k through Charles Schwab. It didn't need a human with a paper to ask you all these questions. It's like credit, income, assets, boom, fully under it. And it happened on an app and it was painless <laughs> to the consumer, right? It's all about, it's all about friction. I mean, I, I would venture to say that Amazon's not the cheapest. I, I, I've actually price shopped and seen that some stuff I could get somewhere else, but the fact that I did it on my phone in the backseat of an Uber while <laughs> listening to my auto <laughs> makes my life easier. No, that's... And that so I tell everyone, if you're not, and I, I think the biggest fallacy that marketers do and salespeople do is, well, how do I get to that person? Stop asking yourself, how do you consume? How does your life How's your life easier through a, a process and are you doing that? So, you know, one of the reasons I'm such a proponent and remind is if, if you just bought a house six months ago, I don't want a, 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 a flyer that says, do you want to sell your home? I love this home. I just got here. I'm eight years in. My kids are big. I might be more interested in selling my home. That's, you know, some markets got decimated during the financial crisis and there are markets within an hour and a half of DC, like in the, where like my brother-in-law lives where the peak of those homes sold for 
800,000. Okay. They went down all the way to 400,000. Yes, 50% off peak. And they've come back to like 650, right? Yeah. But if I were sending mailers, you know, a lot of times you will do, you know, you'll go into our app and go 10 plus years. Well, you no, 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 not in that neighborhood. I want to go back four to eight years back, right? Because if I go 10 plus years, those people are upside down. I want to, I want to find the people that bought in 2010 for 400,000 to maybe 2012, right? They got in between four and 450. Now their homes are worth 650. Yeah. And, and yeah. where, where I think tools like Remind, and I, I'm, 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 I'd be naive to say that I think we're going to do it all, but it's, it's the ones that augment whatever you do as an expert and already works. So what I say to people all the time is like, what should I do in Remind? My first question is, what do you do for marketing? How do you generate yeah. business? And where I 100% confidence say, whatever you do, I can make it better and I can augment or make it easier. Right. 100%. And I think you hit that. I mean, there's, if you're an email marketer, if you are more of the texting, if you're more of the cold calling, if you're more of direct mail, Facebook, you overlay remind lights out. And, and lights the, out. the other one I say, it's like, Hey, if you just use us for your daily workflow of fact finding, getting ready for an appointment, checking balances, and I can give you 30 minutes back because you didn't have to go to three windows. I still feel like I deliver value, right? Because if I give you 30 minutes back, you can either spend it prospecting dollar productive activity or just go home and see your kids earlier. It's that simple for me. 100%. Well, switch, switching gears. So you as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of, I mean, you have a lot of businesses, you have a lot of opportunities. What's your decision making process when you're taking on that next meeting, when you are, looking at this opportunity that was presented to you or just how do you allocate your time? What's your decision making process like? You have a lot of things going on. Yeah, no. And, and again, if you've ever heard me do a keynote or I get interviewed in public, I talk about this subject more than anything else because time is the ultimate equalizer and commodity in my opinion. So whether I'm talking about leverage and I'm talking to people like, when do I make a hire? And I'll, I'll do an, I'll have an audience run an exercise where I say, take your 1099 from last year, your, your total GCI and divide it by 2080, which is 2080 hours, which is what the, uh, labor department says about it's a full-time job. Right. And that number could be for some people, $16 for some people, $50 for some people, $250, right. Towards the end of my career, that was like $1,700 an hour. And so I encourage people to look at their time from that lens at the beginning and then do what lawyers do, which is to walk around with a notepad and write down everything you do in six or seven minute increments. And then after a week, you can actually sit down and mathematically figure out what it is you do for a living. Right. That's a very practical approach. I love that. <laughs> Pragmatic. So what, what I, what I always say is my first hire in real estate at 19 was actually the lady who cleaned my condo on the weekends on Saturdays. And I negotiated a fee where I wanted her to actually deep clean the bathrooms, do the dishes and do my laundry, which is typically out of the scope of someone who cleans, but that's what I negotiated. And you know, whatever her fair value rate for that job is what I want. Mm -hmm. But in those four hours I took her to clean instead of two, A, I got everything I needed for the week, but I more importantly got four hours to go show properties. Because you know, if you're single male and you don't do those things, then you're not going to find a partner, <laughs> right? <laughs> So you got to look presentable. You got to smell good. Your house needs to look good or no one's going to want to come hang out with you. And so that needs to be done. So people say, well, I can't afford it. It's like what you can't afford is not to go show houses on Saturday. Oh, that's awesome. And so if, it, if it's $120 in today's dollars, I probably paid $35 20 years ago, but in today's dollars, $120, $150 for a company to come do those things. Is that $150 worth the investment for you to go show four houses or hold an open house and get some leads? Yeah. Right. And so I encourage people to look at leverage from that level. Like I think the first things you leverage is the personal stuff, right? I, I was speaking at an event and I literally said, if you mow your lawn, you should be embarrassed. And the whole crowd laughed and somebody tweeted it out. Leo said this. 
But what I mean by that is if like literally today in today's dollars, it's about $35 to get a service to come mow your house, right? Because they're now crews and they're machines and they're fast. Yeah. I would argue any, any, any man or woman who mows their lawn for those $35, there's a much better ROI on that time. And to me, it's be with my kids, right? Because that's that emotional energy that gives me the energy to run the 70 hours a week you see me run. Or, yeah. right? And you're being conservative on that. <laughs> yeah, the time change. Sometimes it's 80 hours in, in, in a five day period. That's but true. that exercise then goes all the way up to where I am today, right? It's like, first, if it was an administrative assistant that did the paperwork and the data entry. And, you know, are you a sign installer? Like, are, are you literally driving across town to hang for sold, right? Deliver a package. Yeah. And before you go getting encumbered with bills, with payroll, it's like, hey, there's all kinds of services where it's like, hey, $45 a la carte courier, go return this, mm -hmm. right? But then you really need to start running a PL and and having a budget. And so to, to, to where you went to opportunity, and again, I'm trying to make sure I answer the question the best way possible. It's like, so that you have to start doing that because in, if you don't have that, then you create enough surplus to then have an investable budget. Because real estate makes a lot of money for a lot of agents, but a lot of agents literally operate from, hey, is there enough money in the piggy bank? Okay, I can write some checks next month. But there's no reserves, right? And there's a sequence, you, you build up a reserves and then you get to six months of personal expenses, and then six months of business expenses, then you can have a rainy day fund and then you can have a, when an opportunity presents itself fund, right? Because yes. opportunities have graduated for me from some of the, best opportunities you see in real estate is literally, I actually have a text from somebody I went to high school with who's like, Hey, I know you don't sell houses anymore, but my parents want to sell their house for cash. They don't want to do anything to it. Who would you recommend? I'm like, how much do they want? <laughs> <laughs> I walked into listing appointments where I said to the owner, as is, it'll sell for X. It'll sell for about a hundred thousand dollars as is, where is, and it'll probably be an offer from nowadays. It's, you know, open door and these people or, we can put $20,000 in it and it'll sell for 160. It'll about 90 days on the market between marketing and closed. Right. What would you like to do? And the seller says, I really want uh, the cash and I want to close by Friday. Right. So again, the caveat is you do it openly and transparently and you present all the options. That's right. a right. But a lot of times in my career, it's like, I got the hundred thousand dollars. Right. And A, you gave the best experience to the consumer because that's what the consumer wanted. Boom, I bought the house. I put 20 in it. I sold it for 160. I netted $18,000 after closing costs and commissions and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And my 100 became 118. And then I went back into my piggy bank. Then 118 so. becomes 186. 186 becomes 257. So the reason I'm saying that to you is Remind started as an experiment where I probably spent $600,000 of my own money before we even decided to commercialize it. That's right? so powerful. That's so powerful because I mean, it's it, when we had spent 600 grand on the experiment that was then Remind, it was purely for my consumption. And it was worth it. <laughs> and it absolutely was worth it for you. Right. For me, I was prepared. And, and when I realized that people would pay for it, then I went and raised outside capital and we capitalized it and it became its own entity. And, you know, I decided to make now the time investment of I'm willing to walk away from my real estate businesses yeah. to go for this opportunity because it's this big. But I, what I have been accused of a bunch of times in my life is being lucky <laughs> and lucky because I either saw the opportunity but most of the time it was, I was able to take advantage of the opportunity. And that's where I think that's, if you don't have either the, the knowledge, and I'm not talking about college degree, just like being hyper aware in reading and following trends to pounce on an opportunity where it's like, mm, yeah, this is the way the world's going. I'm going to start running in that direction. And by the way, do you know how to outrun a bear? Uh, I don't. You just, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> that's how market shift, right? I don't need to actually outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. 
And so if I can run faster than the crowd over a 20 year career, I've, I've been able to substantially take advantage of opportunities. And that is a combination of, you know, having a good knowledge base of my surroundings in the industry I want to be an expert in, but also then having the discipline in my personal and business life to create these buckets of capital that when you see an opportunity, you can capitalize on it and not think twice. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, last question again, thank you so much for just being so generous with your time on the last question. It's my favorite one because it's very action based and you yourself are just action, action, action. Um, so if you were to hit the reset button today, if you needed to start all over again today, and I'm going to switch it up. I question all the time, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah? No, that's perfect. Perfect. But we, we want to make sure that we get the – we help out those agents that are struggling right now, just across the border, people that are already high producers that want to get to the, to the Leo level. Um, if you were to restart again today with the same knowledge set, with the same tools, including Remind, what are you doing the next seven days? So – uh, can I answer it differently? Because I, I like the question, but I said if if I were to start over again, okay, I, my philosophies are in D, which is rip off and duplicate. And where I didn't do it at the beginning, so that is how I would start today. But this is actually how I operate going forward on everything. Okay. Because anytime I want to do something, and so and in, and in, in really the question you're answering, you're asking me to answer is kind of timing specific, so that I don't get as excited about that. Because to me, it's like an evergreen piece of content of, of feedback, which is market shift. So whether it's your focus on REO or investors or retail or probate, find someone who's crushing at a high level okay, and call them and say, can I come visit you? And if they say yes, but you must wire me $1,000, $2,000, $10,000 for my time, and you can verify they're an expert, pay the money. And if, you, if they don't ask you for money, make the investment in time and money because it, you're going to spend 1500 bucks on a plane ticket and hotel and, you know, a couple nights. You better take them out to dinner and feed, you know. <laughs> Do something. They're gracious enough to give you time in their office. Yeah. Because the $1,000 to $10,000 you could spend in 48, 72 hours, it's like you're getting the cheat code to the video game. And that's how I believe of doing everything in life. If, when someone's like, hey, I'm going to try Facebook advertisements, it's like, well, you should probably go spend some time with Jamie because what you're, you're, I, 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 I don't want to pay the tax of learning. Learning is expensive because trial and error, as you've learned, can be very expensive if you're buying ads or spending it on postage. 100%. <laughs> So I would encourage, and, and for realtors, the easiest way to do it is find someone in a different market that doesn't see you as a competitor, right? Who's crushing it and has done it for seven or eight years. It's like, I want the copy in the probate letter that works. That's what I want. Wow. I want the call to action in the Facebook ad that works. And I, I have been and from very early on in my career was willing to pay for coaching and or guidance because if I were to give someone a lump sum to pay me for their, their, their eight years of fine tuning and tweaking and getting just right, the calibration of the message, that's gold. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, that's beautiful. Well, again, Leo, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate you being here and just spreading the word uh, and your wisdom with the audience. So, man, again, thank you so much and glad to have you. Yeah, no, so I, I'll, I'll just say if um, anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, as I showed you, I'm actually super accessible. Email me at leo at remind.com. Leo at remind.com, okay. Well, the other one, which is how you and I engage a lot, is uh, because I'm always on a plane and traveling, follow me on Instagram. I actually document quite a bit of what I do and I engage with people because of travel and planes, it's, it's actually even more efficient. When I turn on the Wi-Fi, most of the time text doesn't work and that kind of stuff. So I said, just follow me on either one, uh, follow me on Instagram or email me questions directly. Absolutely, and I'll put that in the description below so that no one has excuses not to reach out to you. There you go. Cool, my friend, thanks so much. My pleasure. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching. Feel free to check out some of the other videos in this channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss another video. Lastly, join our growing Facebook group full of content to help grow your business.